Hey, Jay. Great to have you on the show again. How are you doing? I'm doing fine. Thanks for having me back, Ed. That's okay. Um, and you're calling from New York today? New York City, that's right. We're about to the office there? We are in Midtown East. Actually, this is one of the last few weeks we're going to be here. BlackRock's headquarters are moving to a brand new building in Hudson Yard. So uh, mm-hmm. we're saying farewell to this office and looking forward to the move. So it's brand spanking new, is it? It is, yes. There, yeah. we've, we've heard tales of better coffee machines, better food, uh, incredible views. So uh, a lot of us are excited for this long-awaited move. Oh, awesome. That's great. How many people are moving there? Is it a big office? It's the it's the global headquarters. I, yeah, I it, it's in the thousands. I don't know the exact number, but wow. um, you know, actually, right now in New York, BlackRock is kind of in two, mainly in two offices across the street from each other, and the move will be consolidating everyone under one roof, which will oh, be nice. exciting as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and uh, you've been there nine months now. Obviously, you moved from Global X, and you, yeah, into it's- this role at BlackRock. How's it going? It's been nine months. Yeah, no, it's uh, well, time has flown. I, I joined last April and it's uh, kind of incredible to think we're already at February 2023. Um, yeah. But it has been really exciting. Uh, you know, a few things really stand out. You know, I, I came in to lead uh, thematic and active equity ETFs. Very excited to see that, you know, we climbed to the top of the rankings as a, as the largest thematic ETF issuer in the United States. Uh, a lot of that on the growth of some of our funds like infrastructure last year, which was very exciting. Um, but more broadly than that, uh, you know, two things have really stood out to me about BlackRock that, you know, get me excited every day. And one is, you know, the breadth of the platform that we have both index and active solutions in the thematic space and beyond. So if you think about, you know, do you want kind of index based exposure to an area like cybersecurity or do you want an active manager who can specifically pick within fintech, you know, the winners and, and, uh, and, and focus on kind of stock selection in that space? We really have both options, which I think is really exciting and just allows for an incredible breadth of offering at BlackRock. And then secondly, um, really our expertise around the portfolio. Um, because BlackRock has you know, almost 400 ETFs and many public and private funds beyond that, uh, really puts us in a unique position to be able to talk about really the entire portfolio for any client. And that's really helpful when you're thinking about something like thematic investing, where, you know, a theme might be global in nature and cut across several sectors or styles. There's really, um, you know, some advanced questions around where does this fit in the portfolio? What should I sell? What should I buy? How do I fit this alongside my other allocations? And at BlackRock, I feel like we're really uniquely suited to answer that question for investors, which uh, is, is very exciting to me. Yeah, and as always, the markets uh, don't fail to be interesting, and it's it's another interesting year this year. Um, so I thought we could quickly t- quickly touch on the state of the market today. Um, there's obviously this, uh, this debate that started again of value versus growth, and I know you've been sort of looking into that area. So, just what's the lay of the land as you see it today? Is it time to rethink growth? We think it is. Um, You know, it's interesting. You know, obviously, over the last year plus, as inflation has uh, continued to rise and we've seen interest rates um, really start to uh, to go up in the last few months, the common you know uh, messaging has been value over growth. That value stocks are better positioned in this kind of inflationary environment, and that's true. You know, value stocks have outperformed growth. We've seen uh, at least in 2022, um, and we've seen a lot of flows into value oriented strategies. And frankly, we've seen a lot of flows into more of our valuey themes. Some of the themes that kind of focus more on the industrials and utility space. But that doesn't mean that investors should entirely abandon growth. Uh, a lot of thematic investors, in particular, are are looking at the long term, they want to find long term opportunities. We think that is uh, less of kind of the question of um, should you have growth or not have growth. It's more of a question of within the growth space, where are the best opportunities? And specifically, where are the best opportunities given this market environment, where we have inflation, where we might, you know, still there's possibility of an economic recession, where interest rates are high. Um, So it's really a a story about getting more precise about growth and not just looking broadly at growth as kind of an on-off decision. And so this is related to uh, dispersion returns, which I know you've been talking about. Um, can you just t- tell us about that in more detail and how you, why you think that's important? 
Yeah. So, you know, if you look at basically March 2020, you know, the depth of the pandemic through 2022, growth stocks really traded closely together. Now they traded closely together on the upside from, you know, March to the end of 2021. They also traded pretty closely together on the downside too in 2022 when you saw growth broadly sell off. And so for investors, it really didn't have such a uh, implication for where you are allocated in growth. It really was that question of, are you overweight growth or are you underweight growth? You know, people were rewarded being overweight on the upside and punished on the downside. And that's really, um, that's really more of an unusual environment. Um, the reason why that was the case was primarily driven by, you know, the actions of the Federal Reserve, um, you know, aggressively cutting rates and injecting liquidity into the uh, markets uh, during the pandemic, reversing that trade in 2022, really kind of uh, forced growth stocks to not really differentiate amongst themselves, but really kind of trade together very closely as a specific asset. Um, now that we're entering an environment where interest rate increases are slowing down, maybe we'll even flatline at some point this year, uh, it's going to be less about what the Fed does, and it's going to be more about what these individual stocks do. So we are calling for a return to dispersion, a return to growth stocks not all behaving the same, but actually seeing a lot of differentiation within growth stocks, which is good. That's a that's an opportunity for investors to really single out the growth opportunities that make sense in this environment. Mm-hmm. So basically, w- within certain themes, you're going to see, even in you know within sort of clean energy, the different stocks that make up that theme for you know there's various different ways. That's that's uh, wind, solar, all these sort of things. You, you're going to see differences in the performance of these things more than there was before, basically. You know, we could see differences at the stock level of which stocks do well and which ones don't. I think more likely we're going to see a lot of dispersion between the themes themselves. Um, So we're only a month and a half into the year. um, But uh, if you look at the dispersion across U.S. sectors, it's about 20 percent between the leading one and the and the trailing one. So consumer uh, consumer discretionary and utilities Uh, across themes. The dispersion is about 43 percent this year. So there is already a huge difference between our top performer and bottom performing theme this year. Uh, Now, again, a month and a half into the year, there's a lot that can still change this. Um, But that shows us that in this growth space, we really are starting to see our outlook um, play out, which is that you can really drive a truck between some of the winners and losers this year. Yeah. And do you think we've witnessed sort of a great valuation reset and now growth stocks, relatively speaking, are undervalued compared to times past? You know, valuations have certainly come down. Um, You know, at one point last year, we saw valuations for growth stocks trading pretty closely to where they were, you know, in March 2020 in the in the peak of the pandemic. Um, It's come back a little bit. We've obviously been off to a strong start this year with growth stocks. But, um, you know, you still see valuations more attractive than they were last year. But Taking a step back, um, you know, valuations for growth stocks are not the end all be all, uh, Mm -hmm. because at the end of the day, growth stocks are intended to grow. And so the other part of this equation is what is the growth opportunity for these stocks? You'd be happy to pay a higher valuation for growth stocks that have a much higher, you know, expected growth going forward. So, you know, again, that kind of points back to our dispersion. Yes, you know, the overall level valuations are lower this year than they were last year or at the beginning of last year. Um, but we really want to find those opportunities that can sustain growth, even if there's an economic recession, even if interest rates remain high for a while, because the growth side of that equation in, in many ways is actually just as, if not more important than the valuations that you're getting in that today. Yeah. So let's move on to um, the BlackRock 2023 thematic outlook, which I know you've, you've released uh, relatively recently. Um, could you just give us a, a, a quick overview of, of what you've been looking at, and then we'll dive into some of the specifics uh, on your main findings. Sure. I mean, we talked about it at a macro level. So, you know, valuations are a bit lower. We're seeing more dispersion across growth stocks. We're actually encouraging people to look beyond growth as well into thematic areas that exhibit, you know, some more value characteristics, but still have long-term tailwinds. And, you know, we really are thinking about this concept of resilience, of which areas can really weather this potential economic storm of high inflation and potentially low growth going forward. So we separated into three different areas and we can dive into a lot of details about them. I think there's great you know, stories and opportunities in each of them. Uh, but the first area would be uh, looking at fiscal policy at a tailwind. So if we have high inflation, if we see consumption start to fall, who is the biggest consumer in the world? 
it's the government, uh, where they spend their money is going to have a lot of power in dictating, you know, kind of who succeeds in this environment. Um, the second thing we look at is medical breakthroughs. There's a long pipeline of medical advancements that are starting to really come to the forefront in late stage trials or potentially FDA approvals, which gets us excited about innovation in the medical space. And then finally, we look at what we call technology staples, which are within technology. If you think about technology as kind of a spectrum, you have really out there moonshot ideas that could be totally disruptive, but may or may not pan out and have to have a lot of things go right to work out. At the other end of the technology spectrum are more tried and true technologies that are generating positive cash flows uh, and still have significant growth opportunities behind them. When you think about it in that spectrum, we are more focused on those technology staples, the more proven technology technologies that still have growth ahead, because I think that's going to really give them some ballast during this economic environment. So those are really the three categories that we're focused on. You know, within each of those categories, we think there's several themes uh, that really present interesting opportunities for 2023. So let's dig into the government spending uh, point first. Can you explain how fiscal policy may support clean energy, electric vehicles, infrastructure themes? Sure. Well, you know, in the United States, we had two really important uh, bills passed in the last two years, the first being the Infrastructure Investments and Jobs Act, which was a $1.2 trillion bill uh, to basically reinvest in U.S. infrastructure. Um, and then we had the Inflation Reduction Act, which brought another, you know, $350 billion or so into, uh, into clean energy and electric vehicles. So, uh, and then actually there's a third one, I'll give you a bonus one, which is the Chips and Science Act, which is bringing another few hundred billion dollars into semiconductors in the United States. So these are really powerful bills, billions and billions uh, of dollars uh, in the United States. And they're intended to, uh, first of all, be long-term. Uh, the, the, all this money will not be spent tomorrow. These you know, dollars could be spent over the next five to 10 years, but they're really designed to achieve a specific policy. They look at a specific problem in the United States, our infrastructure is old, or infrastructure hasn't kept pace with population growth or changing preferences of how people use the infrastructure. So throw a bunch of money at it. Similarly, uh, you know, significant government interest in developing manufacturing capacity in the United States in fast growing sectors like clean energy or like electric vehicles, or semiconductors, putting a lot of money towards those use cases. So there's a lot of money out there that is now authorized for the U.S. government to spend, and we're going to start to see a lot of it being dispersed as soon as this year. So there's already over $100 billion from the Infrastructure Investments and Jobs Act, uh, which has been earmarked for spending this year. Um, so this provides significant tailwinds to the companies that are effectively those government contractors, the companies that will benefit from those dollars being spent either directly or indirectly. Mm -hmm. So when we look at the infrastructure space, for example, uh, you know, we look at companies like um, infrastructure enablers, which would be construction and engineering companies that are building the next generation of infrastructure in the United States. Uh, we would also look at infrastructure operators, the companies that operate infrastructure today and may be benefiting some, from some of those government dollars coming out. So there's you know, interesting segments within, uh, within the economy that are really going to you know be the receivers of these dollars coming from the government mm -hmm. so just on the um electric vehicles point of view so the, the prices are improving and it's being helped by government support in that area and um, what are the key hurdles that electric vehicles still need to overcome to fast track the adoption in society i mean there's still these problems they have with um i think in the cold you know it's sort of halves or, or even more than that, the uh, the capacity of the, of the the batteries, uh, and also there's this mileage thing that you know I think we've reached a pretty big hurdle recently. You're getting sort of actually I don't know what it is in kilometers, something 500 kilometers, something off of a full charge. Is it something like this? Um, but still, you get people get these uh, anxiety. I think they've got, they've got a term for it. Um, range anxiety. Yeah, uh, range anxiety. So you know people don't know when they can fill out. They're worried someone's. Uh, you know, going to be taking some of the stations when, when they get there. So, that, you know, there's problems still related to petrol uh, vehicles or gas. Yeah. What's your thoughts on you that? Know, but yeah, you know, it's, it's, uh, in some ways, it's it's an incredible task to completely change how uh, at least passenger vehicles operate in the United States, moving from one very tried and true platform to a completely different one. Um, but the progress has been astounding. Um, you know, electric vehicles over the last few years have really moved from kind of a niche 
uh, innovator or early adopter product to achieving much more mass market appeal. Um, you're totally right. I mean, a lot of that is driven by price. So uh, you look at some of the falling costs in the electric vehicle space. Uh, you look at some of the tax subsidies related to the uh, Inflation Reduction Act. All of that has served to bring down the off the lot cost of buying an electric vehicle. So there are now electric vehicles that, uh, you know, after tax credits uh, can be less than $30,000 in the United States. And there's several more that are less than $40,000 right right now. So if you just think about that from the perspective of the average cost uh, or the average purchase price of a vehicle in December in the United States across all vehicles was about $50,000. You can see that that $30,000 price point, that $40,000 price point means that electric vehicles have already made it more towards the mass market. Um, But you're right. That's not the end all be all. You know, it's not just about uh, having a cheaper uh, price off the lot. It's about accessibility to charging. Uh, People don't really worry about finding a gas station. The density of chargers in the United States is is, is not close to that, um, but that's where the inflation, uh, sorry, the Infrastructure Investments and Jobs Act comes in, which is designed to 10x the number of chargers in the United States mm-hmm. uh, over the life of that bill. So when that comes into play, that addresses a lot of the range anxiety. Um, I think the third pillar, though, is is technology itself. Um, you know, uh, you're mentioning uh, electric vehicles don't perform as well in the cold. Um, not to get too nerdy on this, but there's different types of batteries that have different types of performances. So, um, you know, you may think of like uh, the 93 octane uh, unleaded gas. It's kind of the highest performance gasoline. You know, if you're fueling up a sports car, you'll fuel it up with the 93 octane. The equivalent to that is an NMC battery, which is nickel, manganese, and cobalt. A lot of electric vehicles run on NMC battery uh, chemistry these days. Um, the downside of that high performance, though, is cold weather. Cold weather can impact the range of those batteries. Now, if you think about diesel, you know, diesel fuel can run through anything. It's tried and true. You know, it can run the most powerful trucks, ships, uh, cars. It just it's not the highest performance, but it is a, uh, you know, just a, a machine, for lack of a better word, at turning on and, and operating. Um, the battery equivalent to that is an iron phosphate battery. Um, It's a little bit of an older technology, but it is not as impacted by the cold. Uh, It can go through a lot more charge cycles. It's just a much more robust battery platform. Mm -hmm. So interestingly, as you see more cars coming out and you see battery technology advance, you're actually seeing iron phosphate becoming a a more popular battery design going forward to address Mm -hmm. some of those issues. So the technology is, is absolutely advancing. And then the fourth pillar here for electric vehicle adoption are supply chains. Um, You know, a lot of electric vehicles you can't get your hands on right now. Uh, Mm -hmm. They're simply backordered for months, if not even years, for some of the most popular models. So supply chains are not built overnight, um, but a lot of the... Uh, Inflation Reduction Act and Infrastructure Investments and Jobs Act are all going to kind of grease the wheels of that supply chain uh, to ensure that there is more capacity to sell electric vehicles to this rising consumer demand. So you put all that together, I really think we're at an inflection point for electric vehicles. Yeah. And um, just building on this uh, theme of deglobalization. um, So that, I mean, that sort of started around when, when COVID happened because of some problems, you know, the supply chains basically crumbled for a lot of people. So it forced through change. Do you, is this a change you think is going to stay and, you know, is, is something they're committed to? And if, and if that is so, who's going to benefit the most? I mean, it, you know, it sounds like the government's supporting it. So, uh, but who's going to benefit the most from that long term? Yeah, you know, I, I think that, deglobalization or kind of reshoring of supply chains is probably here for at least the medium term. Um, Yes, you know, part of this is heightened geopolitical risk. Uh, Part of this is, you know, the fragility of our supply chains, which were demonstrated during the pandemic. And a lot of companies are like, you know, I, I don't know how much I can rely on a global supply chain now. If I bring this home, I have a lot more certainty. I have regulatory certainty because I can work with go- ro- local governments. I have, you know, uh, geographic certainty where I'm not dependent on, you know, integrated supply chains to work. So a lot of companies themselves really have a preference for reshoring things uh, closer to their end markets in the United States or in Europe or, or wherever. Um, and then the third piece, you know, it goes back to national priorities. You think about, you know, a lot of really interesting, fast growing uh, fields right now. 
now, uh, like electric vehicles, like clean energy, like semiconductors and artificial intelligence. You know, every government wants to support those industries because they're creating a lot of jobs and creating a lot of economic opportunity. They don't want to see that happen somewhere else. So, you know, I think you you combine, you know, kind of corporate interest and and uh, and government interest in in reshoring a lot of these supply chains, and you know, that's really accelerating this trend. Um, in terms of who the winners are, you know, it's really it's it's across different industries. You know, um, uh, you know, a lot of it will be. Um, we, uh, let me say, winning by not losing. And what I mean by that is, um, you know, uh, it's a it's a success for companies to reshore if they can do so in a uh, cost uh, conscious manner, as well as they do get more certainty out of their supply chain. So if you eliminate some of that risk that was unveiled during the pandemic, you know, that is winning by not losing more robustness in the supply chain. Um, but I think the second winner is again, where does where do the dollars go from the government that is stimulating this uh, trend? Um, going back to the EV example, uh, the government is subsidizing with tax credits thirty five dollars per kilowatt hour hour of battery production. Um, most batteries cost about a hundred dollars to one hundred and fifty dollars per kilowatt hour right now. So thirty five dollar tax credit on hundred to one hundred and fifty dollars is a huge percentage. Uh, of basically a government incentive to develop more batteries in the United States, that $35 actually becomes $45 if you develop an entire battery pack. So you look at a lot of these companies who are you know, thinking about building a bigger battery footprint, um, and they can build it for $45 cheaper in the United States. It's a pretty easy uh, determination to do so. Yeah. That's phenomenal, really. Because that must mean to, to be able to do that, they have to know that once that subsidy goes away, they still make good margins on the production, which means during that period, they must make huge, huge amounts of money. Yeah. You would think so, but a lot of this is driven by scale, right? So, you know, if you look at electric vehicles, you look at clean energy, you look at almost any technology, um, you know, they follow what's called Wright's Law, which is essentially, you know, for every doubling of production, you should see some decrease in uh, the cost of incremental production. You think about if you built one airplane, it costs a lot of money because you're not really sure what you're doing and you have to figure it out. If you build a second airline, you get a little bit better the second time. By the time you've built the fourth airplane, it gets cheaper and cheaper each time. Um, that holds true for a lot of different technologies. Uh, we've seen that in play with certain technologies over the last decade. You look at batteries, which um, you know the cost of batteries has fallen by almost 90% over the last 10 years. A lot of that is because of scale. We've just simply gotten better at building batteries the more that we've built. So, um, uh, and, and, and that's brought the cost down. So um, you can accelerate that by essentially stimulating more demand. If more people want something, you can rapidly scale and accelerate the price declines. That's yeah. what a lot of these policies are doing by subsidizing uh, with tax credits for the consumer and for the manufacturer, for you know government grants that might facilitate more research. All of that is trying to build scale faster so that the actual economic cost without tax subsidies is lower in the future and therefore more profitable. That's great. And so um, the next question is, how, how can we get exposure or how can individuals get exposure to these themes um, at BlackRock? Yeah, well, that's where uh, that's where the great work of the Megatrends team comes in at, at BlackRock. You know, we develop uh, ETFs that provide exposure to these themes. So we have an electric vehicle ETF, uh, iDrive, IDRV, which is really looking across the electric vehicle supply chain at battery producers, even lithium miners, parts suppliers, mm -hmm. car manufacturers really looking across the entire ecosystem of companies that will benefit from more electric vehicle adoption. Uh, similarly, we have a, an approach with uh, clean energy, with ICLN, which is looking across the clean energy value chain at opportunities. Healthcare, I thought we could go on to next, which you, you've mentioned, healthcare innovation. Um, there's been something in the UK, I don't know if you heard about it, in the UK recently, uh, there was a breakthrough in, in CRISPR gene editing. A 13-year-old girl saw a cancer go into remission after receiving a treatment. Um, I think it was called base editing, a type of CRISPR gene editing, uh, which is phenomenal. And I know, I know that's uh, part of what you're going to talk about now. And I thought you could just take us through the innovations in healthcare and why you think it's so important at the moment. I mean, right now we're seeing 
potentially the beginning of what I would call almost a Cambrian explosion, uh, explosion of um, of medical breakthroughs, because uh, we have essentially, I, I, I tend to think too much in financial terms, we basically have the birth of a new asset class of uh, treatments in in uh, in medicine. So if you think about um, what the COVID pandemic has led to, a silver lining of the pandemic is mRNA-based vaccines are now uh, have a lot more investment in them, have a lot more regulatory uh, interest in them for approval, and of course, a lot more research and, and kind of real world experience behind them. So suddenly you can take this technology, which has been around since the 90s, but didn't really have a ton of money or regulatory support, now has a ton of money and some regulatory support. And you can see uh, you know, the wheels turning of different uh, pharmaceutical companies in terms of how do we take this new technology and apply it to different uh, diseases and ailments. So right now, there's a few in in um, in trial phase, which are super interesting. You know, they're developing an mRNA-based vaccine to potentially address the flu. Uh, flu shots are historically not very uh, effective, only about a 50% efficacy rate. If you can raise that to 90 or beyond, you could essentially eliminate the flu from, you know, all of our winters, which, of course, would be very exciting. Um, on top of that, though, they're looking at mRNA-based vaccines for HIV, uh, potentially for treating multiple sclerosis or even cancers. So a lot of different ways to use this technology. Um, you know, the pipeline of medical breakthroughs can take a lot of time, you know, can take yeah. over 10 years. Um, but we're seeing, uh, you know, a lot of these technologies now being applied in late stage trials. The exciting thing will be if the trials do well, if we get expedited FDA approval, then you could see these ideas going from kind of a research um, phase to being really commercialized and generating a lot of revenue. Um, one example of an area where uh, you know it's really um, on the cusp of kind of full FDA approval is a, a drug to treat Alzheimer's, and it's been about 20 years since we've seen a meaningful drug come out to treat Alzheimer's. But with the latest advancements, with latest you know uh, uh, drug trials and and some successes in there, and more F, you know FDA um, interest in the, in these drugs. Um, we could see really a full approval later this year for potentially a groundbreaking drug. So that gets us really excited about the pipeline of medical innovations right now. Why, why do you think it's all happening now? What's led to the, because it's been a while since been, I think, but since there's been some huge advancements here. And, and I mean, I've heard a lot of people keep on talking about it. It feels like the next 10 years is going to be big. So I, I'm just trying to understand why it's all coming together now. There's a lot of different factors coming together. Um, you know, the first one, I would say, let's go back to the pandemic. It really created room yeah. for something like mRNA-based vaccines to be uh, getting invested in and getting approvals. Um, on top of that, you just have a ton of data. Um, so there's a lot more genetic data that's being collected. And the reason for that is that we've had falling costs for um, doing genetic testing. Uh, the first, the very first, you know, human genome project was billions of dollars. Now it costs a hundred, two hundred dollars to get genetic tested. So there's a lot because the prices have come down. There's a lot more uh, collection of genetic data and a lot more analysis of that genetic data. So suddenly you can be looking at the efficacy of drugs not on very basic markers of you know uh, gender and age and uh, family history, but really looking at a genetic level of why did this drug work on this person and not that person. That allows for incredible, much more precise advancements, um, you know, in the medical field. Yeah. Uh, and on top of that, you know, um, so you know, you have you have technological advancements, you have more data, you have falling costs, um, and frankly, we see kind of a population trend as well. You have aging populations around the world uh, that are getting older, that are living longer in retirement, and they're facing a lot of advanced age-related diseases that, frankly, people didn't really face. A uh, hundred years ago, because they weren't living long enough. So Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, um, cancers, a lot of these ailments have been around for a while, but just haven't affected as much of the population. Now that we see aging populations in the U.S. and Europe and Asia, um, there's a lot more demand for these types of drugs yeah. as well. And do you think um, the market is it un underestimating the potential of this theme at the moment? And if so, why? 
Yeah, we think so. I mean, look, uh, you know, in the in the individual sense, a lot of these things are binary, whether a drug is successful or not, yeah. or whether it's approved or not. But when you look at it at the aggregate level of several, you know, dozens of companies across the neuroscience space looking for advancements in Alzheimer's or Parkinson's or beyond, um, you can start to see the trend of, you know, first of all, this group has been heavily hurt by 2022 with the sell-off in growth stocks. A lot of these companies have sold off significantly. Uh, but at the same time, you know, in the aggregate, they're closer to more medical breakthroughs. So, you know, we get excited that valuations have gone down and kind of the closeness of a new breakthrough yeah. has accelerated. So you combine those two together. And I think the market absolutely has kind of uh, uh, lost a, a little bit of interest um, and that creates opportunities for investors. Mm-hmm. And also, like, like you say, if, it, if it's binary, either works or it doesn't. That's why it's interesting when you can get exposure to these, this theme as an ETF. Um, so how, how can people do that at BlackRock? What sort of healthcare ETFs have you got? Yeah, so um, you know, there's 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 really three main ones. I'd say on the thematic side, we have a genomics ETF, IDNA, which is looking at company you were mentioning, CRISPR. You know, companies uh, and techniques that could potentially advance uh, genetic research and genetic treatments. Um, we have a neuroscience ETF, IBRN, which is looking at companies that are accelerating advancements in areas like Alzheimer's and Parkinson's. And then more broadly, we have a biotech ETF, IBB. It's one of the largest biotech ETFs in the world, which is really owning kind of the entire landscape of medical innovation. So you look across those three funds, you can get you know more narrowly targeted into genomics or neuroscience, or look more broadly at the biotech space with uh, with IBB. Awesome. And uh, so let's move on to cybersecurity. Um, I think I took this from your uh, study that cyber attacks are up 81%. Um, over pre-pandemic levels. So they're obviously on a really big um, uptair at the moment. And you think cybersecurity might have moved from a niche to a necessity because of this. Um, can we, can you talk more about it? Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, the pandemic really, um, I would say one of the, one of the, great learnings of the pandemic was obviously that we can work from home in a lot of services-based industries, Mm -hmm. that we can log in on our laptops and still conduct our everyday jobs. One of the downsides of that, though, is you've suddenly had a lot more access points to corporate data. Um, You know, now you're not just protecting inside the walls of an office, you're protecting inside everyone's individual homes. They might be using a laptop, an iPad, a cell phone. There's a lot of different entry points, which is good that it makes it easy on workers, but that also creates more entry points for cyber criminals. So it's uh, not surprising that in this big shift of how people have been accessing data in the last few years, it's created opportunities for cyber attacks. And that's why we've seen cyber attacks up 81%. Uh, The total cost of cyber attacks in 2023 is expected to be over $8 trillion. So it it has become a massive toll on the economy. Now, I want to get back to this concept of tech staples, you know, in the tech sector, what are the companies that we can't live without? And increasingly, I think cybersecurity has become a tech staple. So, you know, we're in an uncertain economic time. We see companies are cutting back in certain areas, whether that's reducing headcount or reducing real estate or uh, cutting back on, you know, free chips and candy in the kitchen. Um, But where we don't think they're going to cut back is cybersecurity. It has become just an essential to corporations to be able to protect their data uh, for, uh, you know, for competitive reasons, for ethical reasons, for monetary reasons, um, you name it, but it has essentially become, you know, a a utility to these companies. So Mm -hmm. that makes it more of a staple, even in this economic environment, we don't see, uh, we don't see a a slowdown in cybersecurity spend uh, coming forward. In fact, if you look at some survey data, it actually shows most uh, CTOs or, C- or CIOs of companies are expecting to spend more money on cybersecurity in 2023, not less. And um, are these mainly software as a service companies uh, you, where, you know, the, you know, you're paying a, these enterprises are paying a monthly fee to get uh, security basically against these sort of attacks? They largely are, but increasingly we see opportunities in hardware as well. So, you know, you know, of course, kind of a VPN login and, you know, uh, virus scans and all that is, you know, some of the security that you might see, you know, on the software side of things. But, you know, think about, you know, fingerprint readers or iris scanners or, you know, very, or facial scanners. You know, a lot of these different technologies to enable security are also happening in the hardware space. So what we get excited about is both the software side as well as that hardware side. And looking into the future, how big can this be? I mean, if every company has to have some sort of security, it's obviously quite a big 
market. Have you done some research into the scope of where it is today and how big it can get in the future? I mean, we're still in the early stages of, of cybersecurity. And part of that is we're still kind of in the middle to somewhat early stages of the migration to cloud computing. So, you know, a lot of data is still stored locally um, on people's computers rather than uploaded to the cloud. The more things are uploaded to the cloud, the more it's accessible. But then, of course, the more you have to be defending against that accessibility. So as we see more cloud adoption, uh, there's more opportunities for cybersecurity. As we just see more data collected, there's more opportunities for cybersecurity. So we think about how much data we're collecting every day uh, with artificial intelligence. Uh, you know, we're seeing generative AI, which is now creating its own data. It's creating its own content that has to be gated and protected by cybersecurity as well. Um, so it really creates a massive opportunity for, uh, for these companies. In fact, it's actually quite difficult to put a total addressable market on it. Um, because there's so many different applications of cybersecurity. Um, yeah. And we just, we look at so many different trends around the world, autonomous vehicles, the metaverse, um, uh, you know, augmented reality, all these things are different ways to collect and process yeah. data that's going to have to be protected by cybersecurity. So anything that has a network that can be hacked into basically, I hadn't thought about that. Yeah. So it's a lot larger scope than just computers, personal computers, basically. Yeah. And um, Absolutely. Is there, I had a question is there a risk to the industry that cybersecurity becomes a sort of commodity in the end and the prices, you know, that, that people are willing to pay are driven down? Or is that something, you know, you could think could happen? Or is it always going to be difficult to, you know, you're going to have to cut these companies out to constantly learn and, and develop to the new um, nature of how uh, hackers are attacking the systems? Yeah, you know, there's kind of a never ending cat and mouse game between uh, cyber securities and cyber criminals, right? So the technology is always going to have to continue advancing. Uh, you know, what's interesting is I, I think it's actually going the other way. Uh, we've seen a lot of M&A in the cybersecurity space recently. And part of that is, um, you know, companies want to have kind of a full offering of cybersecurity. Maybe they got started in a specific niche, but now they yeah. want to have kind of an entire platform. So we've seen a lot of M&A for that reason. The other reason is there's really, there is a network effect to cybersecurity, which is if you are a, a software provider for cybersecurity, the more networks you're on and the more computers you're on that you can be assessing these cyber attacks, the more you learn uh, and the more you can build up those defenses in the future. So uh, if you're on 10% of computers around the world versus 30% of computers around the world, you actually have a huge advantage uh, by being on more. So we think that's going to continue to uh, lead to more M&A in the cybersecurity space as well. Uh, and frankly, be really helpful for um you know, these massive cybersecurity companies that are just going to be trying to own every service within cybersecurity and have access to the most data. So that that kind of, um, I would say, kind of goes against the idea of commoditization, that really there's going to be very powerful uh, uh, cybersecurity kind of dominant companies the way we might have in internet retail or in search. So let us know about the uh, cybersecurity ETF at BlackRock. What's, uh, what, sure. What the, uh, so oh, this ticker... Yeah, absolutely. This ticker is IHAK, I-H-A-K. Um, this is a cybersecurity ETF that is investing across the cybersecurity ecosystem, much like all of our themes. It's not just looking at, you know, a couple companies in the space. It's looking globally at leaders in cybersecurity across both software and hardware. So this is a fund uh, that is largely, you know, if almost exclusively holding technology stocks. Um, but again, if we think about this spectrum of technology from moonshot ideas to kind of more profitable proven ideas, cybersecurity is much more in that kind of profitable proven ideas uh, or, or product space. I will add another good thing about that is, you know, because we have higher interest rates, um, because valuations have come down on a lot of technology firms, uh, it's harder to get external investment and growth. You know, you're either paying a lot more if you're, you know, trying to raise money via a bond or you're getting a worse valuation if you're issuing stock. So the companies that can kind of self-fund growth that are profitable or a positive cash flow are in a really strong position because they're making money. They can decide to use that money to acquire a competitor or to invest more in R&D or to hire a bigger sales team, whatever it is that they want to do. And because cybersecurity, because a lot of cybersecurity firms are profitable, that means that they don't have to depend on the capital markets for growth. Um, and we think that gives them more resilience in this uh, high interest rate environment. Let's move on to robotics now to finish up uh, the interview. How is robotics the solution to supply chain challenges, labor shortages and inflation? 
Well, we talked about this a bit already with, uh, you know, supply chain resilience and reshoring of supply chains in the United States. Um, you know, there's a lot of reasons why companies want to do that. Um, but the biggest uh, hurdle for these companies to reshore is cost. Um, that if they were manufacturing something overseas and they bring it back to the United States, they're going to have to pay kind of a premium for U.S. Uh, labor and manufacturing. The way to combat that is to use technology to make labor more productive. And robotics and artificial intelligence is um, likely to be one of the most powerful tools for productivity of all time because it enables people to focus on things that humans are good at and allows robots and AI to do things that robots and AI are good at. So, you know, if you think about, um, you know, the manufacturing process, there's a lot of, you know, uh, difficult things to do. Um, for a machine, you know how to you know how to build a, a factory, how to implement different technologies in a factory. Maybe uh, even part of the assembly line is just it requires too much dexterity or too much creativity uh, to you know assemble something. But there's a lot of aspects that are pretty routine. Um, you know, picking up something and putting it in a box, taking something out of a box, putting it on a shelf, uh, moving something to different trucks around a, a distribution warehouse. A lot more of that can be automated going forward with these advancements in robotics and AI. And we think companies are really going to invest heavily in it to ensure that as they reshore and they bring more manufacturing into the United States and more distribution capabilities, uh, they're going to be leveraging robotics as much as possible to keep those costs low. And how far is the automation going to go? Are we going to see it, um, well, or robots in more general, like drone deliveries they talked about you know, for a while, they sort of lost their hype a little bit, but is that something, well, deliveries by robots in some shape or form, potentially, or um, automated cars as well. We've talked about this. When do we, are these related to this theme? And, and when do you sort of see these things playing out, if, if ever? You know, we, we absolutely could. Um, and those would certainly be very public facing uh, examples of robotics. In the near term, I think the reality is that robotics is going to have huge advancements kind of behind the scenes. Um, so if you think about uh, buying something online, you know, you order, you click buy, it goes to your credit card, they start to execute that order. You think about all the different steps that happen to be able to execute that order. First of all, whatever you are buying, let's call it tennis balls, had to come off a truck and go into some sort of storage system. Um, Right now, people are taking those things off a truck and putting it into a bin, and a robot is actually doing the work to store it. It's picking up you know, a series of bins kind of stacked on top of each other and taking it into a holding area until that order is called upon. But then you've purchased your tennis balls. That robot picks up that shelf. It brings it over to a human. A human is taking those tennis balls off a shelf. It's putting it into a bin. A bin is getting shuttled away to a different part of the uh, warehouse. And a human is taking that tennis ball and putting it into a box, slapping a label on it, and shipping it out. Some aspects of that process have been automated already. So, you know, the bins moving around the, uh, the warehouse floor, that's relatively automated with conveyor belts. Uh, the storage process, that's relatively automated by robots. But still the physical act of taking something out of a truck and putting it into a bin is largely done by humans. This is a huge opportunity for robots to take that part of the process and automate it. Similarly, putting that uh, tennis ball into a box, that's something that robots are getting better and better at. So um, essentially different parts of this uh, supply chain are likely to be automated as robots get better. Um, and we're seeing incredible advancements in the space where robots can get more accurate and more thoughtful about, okay, this is a tennis ball. Where do I pick up the tennis ball? How do I center its weight? How much force do I need? And what kind of box am I putting it in? Uh, all of those are relatively recent advancements, but they are getting to the point where it's likely to be implemented in warehouses going forward. Mm -hmm. So um, I think it'd be very cool to get a drone delivery of the tennis balls. Um, I think that's a little bit of a ways off. Yeah. Behind the scenes though, there's gonna be a lot more automation coming. Yeah, I've seen, I think a lot of people have seen these, but the Boston Dynamics videos, of the, you know, the, the, the robotics that they've got there. I, I've seen one that was related to exactly what you're saying. I think, you know, picking up boxes and putting them in the back of trucks and stacking them in trucks. And it was just incredible how advanced these things are getting at the moment. Um, so why, what is robotics as a service? That's something that you mentioned in your report. Um, robotics as a service is basically leasing a robot instead of buying it. Um, the appeal of this is that if you are a company that doesn't really have expertise in artificial intelligence or robotics, you know, easier to rent instead of buying at first. 
Um, another aspect is seasonality. So uh, imagine you're a mall and malls get more popular in the major shopping seasons around Thanksgiving to Christmas. Um, you can either go out and you can hire more security guards for about a month, or in theory, you could uh, use robotics as a service to lease robots that provide security. Uh, you know, you might even be seeing these in malls these days of like robots that are patrolling the floors and have cameras attached to them and, uh, you know, would alert some sort of central command if it noticed something going on that uh, was a security risk. So that gives companies a lot more flexibility to uh, dip their toes into the robotics space. Now, the challenge with robotics as a service is, you know, you essentially have to have a uh, kind of commoditized function with robotics. Um, you know, if we think about, you know, kind of a popular form of robots, it's it's general AI. It's, a, you know, a robot butler that can do everything. You can tell it to tie your shoes, drive the car, whatever it is. It can do everything. That's not the case with robotics today. Robots are very specialized. There's robots that, uh, you know, are literally just designed to pick something up out of a bin and put it into a box, right? Um, so uh, to the extent you have kind of these commoditized functions uh, that are cyclical or that you want to lease, then great. Robotics as a service absolutely works. Uh, in November, you know, a major retailer is going to want to have more uh, robots picking stuff out of box, uh, out of bins and putting them in boxes. Um, but it is somewhat limited today to still kind of what are those commoditized robotics tasks because robots are so specialized. So we think this is an interesting growth area. It'll become an even more incredible growth area as we see robots get um, kind of more capable of doing more things. And are there any other sort of innovative use cases? such as that for healthcare and others? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, um, we're seeing robots being utilized more and more in surgeries. So, you know, uh, hip replacements, knee replacements, we're seeing robots that are kind of putting guardrails around where a surgeon might be operating or actually provide a level of precision beyond what the human hand can achieve. So I think that's a really exciting space. You know, we're seeing more service robots, you know, whether it's, you know, fast food joints that are serving coffee given, you know, by a robot. Um, you know, I think right now that uh, is still kind of a very nascent area, but it could be growing very yeah, quickly. Yeah. So I think the reality is um, we are going to be seeing more robots in our everyday lives. Hopefully not because we're all getting knee replacements, although aging populations, yes, we are going to see more knee replacements. But um, more realistically, uh, you know, we've seen it with ChatGPT recently. Like we're going to be interacting with robots because they're providing a service to us in a really seamless mm -hmm. way, whether that's helping with search, whether that's helping with as a chat bot, maybe it's serving a cup of coffee. But really, it's all kind of uh, an upward trajectory from here in terms of how often we're going to be interacting with robots going forward. Do you see other themes that are potentially benefit from the success of robotics, such as I assume things such as semiconductors and? Yeah, uh, semiconductors would be you know a huge area to look at because you know frankly um, robots are getting smarter. They have more sensors attached to them. Those it's creating more data. The data needs to be processed, stored, and analyzed. All of that is coming back to semiconductors. So you know you think about you know, the robots that were building cars, you know, over 40 years ago, were not very smart, not very connected, not getting a lot of data. They were simply picking up stuff and putting them down in a pre-programmed way. Now, the smartest robots have all kinds of sensors attached to them to understand how close they are to a human, how fast they should be moving, how is this object different than a previous object. All of that data needs to be collected, processed, and, and, uh, and analyzed. Semiconductors really are kind of at the, at the heel of all of that. Um, also, you know, if you look beyond that, uh, you know, I would say um, uh, data uh, in general, kind of companies that are processing data, collecting data, gen uh, you know, using that to develop our latest generation AI software, obviously big winners as well. I think of robots as the body, AI is the mind, the people that control the most data are going to have the smartest minds. So, um, you know, we look to that space as an as a, as a interesting area as well. And how can people get exposure to robotics as a theme? We have our Robotics and Artificial Intelligence ETF, uh, IRBO, Erbo, um, that provides exposure to the entire ecosystem. So that's looking at companies that are both developing the hardware for robots, the software and AI for robots, as well as, you know, parts and sensors that go into it. So, you know, again, I think... Uh, 
for any theme. It's not just about the end product. It's not just about buying the company that builds the robot. It's about the entire ecosystem behind it yeah. that facilitates a, a robotics ecosystem. So IRBO. And then more specifically, um, you know, looking at the semiconductor space, which we've mentioned several times uh, throughout this interview for robotics, for fiscal tailwinds, um, uh, that is uh, kind of best uh, gained exposure to by SOX, S-O-X-X, which is our semiconductor ETF that's owning semiconductor manufacturers uh, around the world. Amazing. Thanks, Jay. I mean, it's been great to have you on the show again and uh, have an update on, on all things thematic um, and some really interesting themes you've highlighted there that I'm, I'm sure everyone's going to be really interested in. Um, did, is there anything you would like to, to say before before we uh, wrap up? Also, maybe touch on where people can find more information um, about the ETFs and maybe follow are you on Twitter. Can they follow you there? Yeah, absolutely. So thank you for having me. This was a lot of fun. We covered a lot of ground, but there's still more ground uh, left to be covered. So for people that are interested, uh, I would point them to iShares.com that will have all the information about these ETFs. iShares.com slash insights has uh, the research that we're constantly putting out about the space. We just put out a piece on ChatGPT that I think is pretty exciting. Um, and then finally, they can follow me on Twitter, which is jjacobcfa. So J-A-Y-J-A-C-O-B-S-C-F-A. Um, Sometimes I'm tweeting about thematic stuff. Other times I'm tweeting about food. So uh, you can pick your interest. Uh, I'll, I'll be hitting on both of those. <laughs> yeah, I have to say the the research. I was impressed by the research articles at, at BlackRock on on the themes. You, you really do dig into the the details on it. So I recommend people go and have a look at that. But I'll put some links in Thank the uh, show notes for those that are interested. So thanks again, Jay. Have a good day, and uh, hope we we'll catch up again sometime soon. Wonderful. Thanks for having me, Ed.